I wanted to do something on the refractive index of air, which has held my attention since doing this tricky measurement as an undergrad and preparing a lab report describing the whole theoretical aspect of it. More recently, I've challenged myself to think up situations where refractive index of air matters. For simplicity, treat the atmosphere as a homogeneous dielectric that suddenly ends at the top of the stratosphere. If this satellite attempts to ping a location obliquely at 30 degrees, Snell's law leads to the conclusion that the location will be off by 3.5 meters. Some applications, such as satellite location of an oil drilling site, require imaging accuracy of several meters, and 3.5 more meters of error does not help. And what about satellite ranging? How far away is it, and how fast is it going? The refractive index gradient adds a systematic offset to the path length and time of flight, and hence the Doppler shift, of any signal being used to that end. Geodetic data are collected near the surface of the Earth, where the refractive index gradient is largest, and also at large angles to that gradient, making the ray bending more significant and leading to refraction error in the measured location of the river bank in this picture. To see it, divide the space into strata, each layer having a larger refractive index than the layer above it. The theodolite needs to point along the blue dashed line in order for it to sight the river bank by receiving real light, which follows this red line. As light crosses each imaginary boundary between strata, it refracts and changes direction, causing the instrument to point in one place, while the operator is viewing another place. Interferometry is how refractive index is measured. Light enters a Fabry-Perot interferometer and recombines with the original beam after traveling an optical path length that depends on refractive index. The sine squared in the denominator of the output light produces a periodic variation as the mirror separation is varied. Every time the mirror separation increases by delta d, the irradiance has a peak and the refractive index of the medium can be computed. Here's that lab report I mentioned, written back when we still used typewriters. An incoming laser beam was split and sent toward the two mirrors of a Michelson interferometer. The reflected beams recombine and are expanded, revealing interference fringes. As the optical path length changes due to changing gas pressure, the light at the center of the bullseye alternates between dark and bright, and the refractive index can then be determined. I tabulated the results as the refractivity of the gas, where refractivity isn't n, but rather n minus 1, which is useful because the physics of refractive index of gases applies to those digits that are after the decimal point. Adding air between lens elements makes a lens slightly weaker, causing the image to move farther out. For this photolithography lens, the image shifts out by 200 microns when the vacuum is replaced with air. That's well within the built-in mechanical compensation, sure, but isn't it better to not knowingly include systematic errors in the design, especially since those errors had unexpected consequences? And it has to do with the height that rays penetrate the elements. The rays from the edges of the object need to clear the element edges and my own computation found that the necessary diameter of this lens element was 12 millimeters larger when the air was let in. And underestimating clear apertures could lead to vignetting, which may look nice in a wedding photo, but not in lithography. Another consequence of the ray height increasing with air is that aberrations increase significantly. To be fair, there are a lot of surfaces in this lens, and these effects should be pretty unnoticeable in most lenses, but here's the point. Especially when designing a multi-million dollar lens, it might be worth it to change all of those n equal ones to n equal whatever it should be. It may help to know why air even has a refractive index, and it begins with the atoms and molecules. Positive and negative charges are centered at the same place both in atoms and in homonuclear diatoms, such as the nitrogen molecule. Polar molecules have a different location for these two charge centers, but let's just consider an atom for now. An electric field causes the positive nucleus and the negative electrons to shift in opposite directions, making a dipole moment that's proportional to the applied field. 
Alpha prime is the volume polarizability, so-called because it has dimensions of volume, and it indicates how easily the atom or molecule becomes polarized. Now a dipole makes its own electric field, let's call it the induced field, which opposes the applied field so that the net internal electric field, which now is the sum of these two, is smaller than the applied field. And that's what a dielectric does in a nutshell. It reduces the electric field inside of itself. Okay, so how does polarizability lead to a refractive index? They're related to the Lorentz-Lorentz equation, which comes from that linear relationship between applied electric field and molecular dipole moment, and can be derived as homework in any undergrad e &M course. It works quite well for gases, being homogeneous mixtures, for solids, liquids, and gases with inclusions, such as raindrops, there are more sophisticated treatments. But this is the form that's usually printed in textbooks, so let's unpack it. On the right-hand side, there's Avogadro's number, rho is mass density, big M in the denominator is the mass of one mole, then there's the volume polarizability, alpha prime. To simplify it, look at this ratio. Write it out using units instead. Cancel what cancels, and you'll see that it's actually the number of molecules per cubic meter or the number density. And although I don't have an instrument to measure molecules per cubic meter, I can measure pressure and temperature. So I'll let the ideal gas law tell me what the number density is. The number of moles times the universal gas constant is the number of molecules times the Boltzmann constant. That's baked right into these two fundamental constants. So then let's use this expression of the ideal gas law. N sub V is big N over volume, and the ideal gas law tells us that the number of molecules over volume is also P over KT. And I just showed that the number of molecules per volume is also Avogadro's number times density over the molar mass. So now there's a nice way to incorporate quantities that can be measured, like pressure and temperature. Now insert this into the Lorentz Lorentz equation, putting it in terms of P and T. And here's a way to pull out the refractive index, which for a gas is typically 1 followed by three zeros, in which case it's fair to replace n squared plus 2 with the number 3, simplifying the left side of the equation. Now factor the n squared minus 1 and replace n plus 1 with the number 2. n plus 1 will only be wrong by 0.15% and the systematic error in the refractive index will only be a couple parts in a million. So set these two equivalent expressions equal to each other and solve for the refractivity. That's the number we measure. That's the number that scales with the ideal gas law. One last detail is how do you get the volume polarizability alpha prime? You could back it out of the measured refractive index, but polarizabilities have been deduced through a variety of experimental methods and are tabulated on the NIST website. So the polarizabilities of the ground states of the three main components of air are tabulated here. Most air molecules are in the electronic ground state unless they've been excited by you know, maybe a cosmic ray. And dry air is a mixture of these and it should have an effective polarizability that's a weighted average of them. But that turns out to be 2% lower than the value that I backed out of the measured Selmayr equation and 4% lower than the value published here in this MJ Phys paper. And my guess is that there are enough molecules not in the electronic ground state, as well as isotopes, to ever so slightly raise the effect of polarizability. So compute the refractive index using this polarizability. At STP, our working equation gives 1.002937, which certainly compares well to the Selmayr equation for air published by Sidor, but only at 522 nanometers. And wavelength is important. Air has this refractive index provided that it's at STP at 522 nanometers, there's no water vapor, there's no CO2, it isn't ionized, and so on. Various conditions of air can be accounted for, and I do recommend Sidor's paper to find out about this. To correct for temperature and pressure, back to the ideal gas law. In our working equation, it's clear that refractivity is proportional to pressure over temperature. So take the ratio of refractivity at the P and T of interest to that at STP. 
Rearrange this to get an expression that scales the refractivity known at STP or known anywhere actually to the refractivity anywhere else. Of course, air is a real gas with van der Waals interactions between molecules, so the compressibility computed using the Viriel expansion can be included as a higher order correction and sometimes is. Shouldn't the water and humid air raise the refractive index? Well, it doesn't, per this aptly nicknamed shop floor formula from NIST. As relative humidity varies from 0 to 100%, refractive index varies in the sixth decimal place. Still important for length interferometry, but probably not for optical design. So why so little variation? Well, it's water vapor in the air, not condensed water droplets and it decreases with humidity only in part because humid air has a lower density, but back to the NIST database. The polarizability of an H2O molecule is 1.501 cubic angstroms, similar to but smaller than nitrogen, argon, and oxygen. So water vapor is similar to, but slightly less refractive than the other components of air. Now a refractive index measurement is done at some wavelength and often with a Heaney laser. So dispersion needs to be described using the Selmeyer equation, which accounts for the different absorption peaks. There are multiple resonant modes that give rise to a wavelength dependent refractive index, and there's a different restoring force for each mode, meaning that a molecule is a system of damped harmonic oscillators with specific resonant wavelengths. Any excitation near resonance will drive the system into deep absorption and the refractive index into anomalous dispersion, leaving the medium opaque. The equation is on physical near a resonance, but the significant resonances are in the ultraviolet for most gases, so the Selmeyer equation, which only describes the tails of the Lorentzian peaks, offers a good model for refractive index at most useful wavelengths. Certain gases like methane and carbon dioxide have resonances in the infrared, which make them opaque at certain infrared wavelengths, giving rise to the greenhouse effect. Because N is approximately unity for a gas, the left side of the Selmeyer equation can be simplified to 2 times N minus 1, with these coefficients for oscillator strength and resonant wavelength determined empirically, revealing the values in the red equation. This is the Selmeyer equation for air at 15 degrees Celsius. I'll include pressure and temperature scaling, and you can go ahead and use standard temperature and pressure. So here we have the temperature, pressure, and wavelength dependence of the refractivity of air, and it looks like this. The refractivity varies by about 10% over the wavelength range, and most of the variation occurs below 500 nanometers. Oh, and how did I get that effective polarizability of the air mixture? I took the Selmeyer equation at STP to the limit of infinity, then plugged it into our working equation to get alpha. Now this fast technique seems to always give me values that are 1 or 2 percent too high, so if you can, it's better to use the good values from NIST. I didn't make this stuff up, and only so much can be said in 15 minutes. Everything I discussed and more is incorporated into a useful online refractive index of air calculator that you can find on the NIST website. I hope you find it useful. 